This is the new Metro New York market. This panel, we're going to take a look at what new technology, processes, logistics have materialized in the businesses. Um, each area is represented by, um, by the panel, and I'd like to introduce the panel now, and they will give a little bit of background about themselves, and then we'll go into the discussion. First, um, my name is Alan Markowitz. I'm one of the senior assurance partners at Markham. With that, um, we have Rich Dunbar, Zach Romanoff, and Jenna Zaleski on, on the panel, and I'll let each of them take a few minutes to introduce themselves. Zach? All right. Good morning. Hi, my name is Zach. Can you hear me all right? Okay. My name is Zach Romanoff. I'm the president of Omni Food Sales. Omni Food Sales is a food sales and marketing company. The industry terminology is broker. But Omni's really evolved to more than a broker, and I'll shed a little light on why later. Omni is a family business, so similar to Stu, I can relate to all things about family business, and it's quite interesting and does deserve its own conversation separately. But I'm actually fifth generation in the food industry. My father founded Omni Food Sales uh, 27 years ago off the heels of a food distributor, and he was out in the boroughs in New Jersey, um, developing routes and through the contacts and relationships that he made with store owners food brands actually contacted him and approached him about starting to represent their brands so that's how Omni Food Sales was founded we have a, a base in in the meat department also represent lines in the deli dairy frozen and and some grocery lines as well uh, we call on every traditional supermarket retailer that's in the, the metro New York area which used to be Metro New York was three states. Now it's like up to seven states, and it's over 1,500 stores. Uh, there's a lot of ground in between, and the role of, of a broker has really changed. You know, a lot of brands figure, oh, yeah, we'll hire a broker. They'll do the retail for us. And maybe 25 years ago, that kind of was the role of a broker. But over time, that role has changed. And the word broker has not evolved properly to to give credit to what brand advocates do. So I coined that phrase a few years ago, brand advocate, because that's what we're doing. We are advocating for our brands every day. And somewhere along the lines, the term broker had a negative connotation with it because brokers weren't brought in, they weren't part of the process, they weren't, they weren't made a partner. Now there's so much that's going on. It's not just doing retail checks and filling out checks on a box and sending in a piece of paper and saying we did the retail check. There's forecasting, there's planning, there's negotiating, there's strategic thought, there's, there's so much that goes into it. It's, if you're lucky to get the business, that's one piece, but then once you get the business, how do you keep it? Because now you've created a, a wave and other people are trying to get that from you, so now it's how do you protect that business? And then how do you grow it year over year? So working with brands to really develop these long-term strategies, an advocate is more applicable because that's what we are. Similar to how an attorney represents their client, whether their client is innocent or guilty, you've got to protect the best interests of that client. That's what Omni does for our brands while also doing what's best for the retailer and the supermarket as well. Okay, it has been stated that technology is both a blessing and a curse. Um, can you each describe how it has been both a disruptor and or and a broad benefit to your clients? Well, where or oh, where to start? Uh, let's just say, what a beautiful time to be alive. The food industry or supermarket industry has thrived, by and large, for the last you know, several decades. And I think retailers got comfortable. And I think that's an OK thing. But really, what I what I'm, would like to say is there is a way of doing business that has been accepted, has been successful. 
But like other industries, like you see traditional retail starting to be challenged about what's going to be sustainable and be successful, the supermarket is reaching a checkpoint where other technologies are knocking at the door. Amazon Go has a store in Manhattan where you literally could just open up your phone, go through a store and shop and not have to talk to anyone. Um, Bezos, you know, he's going to shake the tree. He's going to see what falls out. And some people are going to get influenced by that. Some people will be gobbled up by that. But it won't be everyone. There will be, you know, the larger players will stay and be successful. But it's a time for retailers that maybe thought what they were doing was successful for the last 30 years. It's time to add a few new wrinkles into what's going on. I mean, just another thing, we're going to see drone deliveries. I mean, that's in the works. That's coming. Products are going to be drone delivered. And that's in addition to club stores. That's in addition to online ordering. That's in addition to all the other new technologies that are kind of on the outside working their way in. But, but by and large, like more specific, it's been great. Data, right? This is like the data revolution. There's all this information available. Manufacturers and retailers always could tell you, oh, I did X percent of my business during these three months. That's great. But now they could actually drill it down to the day of the week and the hour of that day that they sell the most of their products. And that information is being communicated to partners like us so that we know when to go out and, and our retail team, when they're going to stores, they know what days the set needs to be billed because that's the day that they're going to get the rush of business. So you're going to see more insights. You're going to see brands coming out with more products that are built with these um, data insights in mind to better, better serve consumers. You'll also see better groupings of products. You know, the data is going to show that if people are buying this, they buy this with it. So you're going to see better cross promotion and just more overall efficiency in the store to help better serve consumers. And as far as downside or, or, or threat, I don't see any downside. I think it's all plus, all positive. People just need to embrace it for what it is and then make the wrinkles appropriately. Thank you. With those kind of disruptors and those kind of things on the horizon, what trends are you seeing in the short term in order to achieve it and, and, and get there? Zach? Everyone's looking to use technology to make their stores better to obviously make more money. So one thing that you'll see, I mean, you may see robots walk, uh, scanning the floor in some supermarkets and they be, may be detecting if there's a spill or a cleanup needed. So then you know, they could send someone appropriately to help. Um, you're also seeing, and, and especially as a result of the minimum wage going up in New York City, a focus on automated cash out registers, registers and, and machines. So less people at the register um, and more machines. And I'm okay with that because, I mean, for me, one of the, my pet peeves of going to a supermarket is having to wait online at the register. So seeing that, you know, I'm okay with that. I think the technology needs to improve. Um, there's still a lot of glitches and, you know, I'd say half the time or one in every three times, someone needs to come over and then reset the machine because the machine can't handle the groceries that I've got on the self-checkout. So that needs to improve. Um, and also, this perhaps is not a trend yet, but something that I would like to see is let's take those people that were the cash registers and let's train them and let's build them up and let's put them in the store. Let's put them at the top and bottom of every aisle and let them be there, not going up to consumers because that's kind of invasive, but let's just have them there. Because just for example, on a Thursday night, I get a text message from my wife, Zach, can you go pick up? organic rice puffs from the store, and it's a picture of a brand that I haven't seen before, and I go to the store, not only do I not know where it is, but I have to wait on a customer service line that takes 10 minutes to get to it, there's one person there, and then as soon as I get up there, that person's looking at me like, why are you wasting my time? You know, these are things that, that we can improve the overall store shopping experience by reinvesting and reallocating and changing the way we manage the stores. You know, educate people. Millennials, I am a millennial, right? The millennials, someone mentioned, are reading the Nutrifacts. That's only the beginning, all right? These are, millennials are becoming the houses of, of influence in the country and will in the next eight years, they will continue to. Reading the Nutrifacts is step one. I mean, there's a lot more. We wanna have in-depth conversations. We wanna know what we're feeding our families. We wanna know what's good, what's bad. If there's a difference between these two brands, I mean, think about it. Moms and dads are making split-second decisions 
at the shelf where I work in the industry. I have time to know the difference between different brands, to understand what misleading marketing is. The average person does not have time to do that, and they need help when they get to the store. And they would help if, similar to like a college university, where they have these blue lights around the campus, where if there's an emergency, you hit the blue light, and then in two minutes, security or police comes by to help someone. What if there was something like that in a supermarket? where you could hit a button and then a customer service rep comes up to you and answers questions for you about the products that you're looking at. So I think there are, there's a lot of trends and things that we will see and the smart retailers and supermarkets will embrace this and start to ingrain it into their stores now. We are truly enter, entering the age of data analytics. Um, how have you seen companies utilize data analytics in the process and how have companies started getting involved with that analytics in the processes. Zach, I bet you're seeing it quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I know I touched on it a little bit earlier. I'd like to ask a question. This is for anyone here. Can someone tell me what is their favorite retail store to go to? Okay, any others? Nordstrom. Nordstrom, any others? Wegmans. What about, what about retail included, not just supermarket industry? Any store? Apple Store, that's my favorite store too. And that's my favorite store because if my phone is speaking a foreign language, has a crack in the screen, or has turned blue when it was originally red, whenever I go to any Apple Store, not just one, any, I'm greeted at the front, I'm put on a queue, they ask me what the problem is, and I'm sent to the appropriate person. And they process me literally until my problem is solved. They'll get other technicians, they'll get someone on the phone, they'll give me a replacement, Literally, it's the best customer service that I've ever experienced, and I've never walked out of the store not satisfied. Do you think somewhere along the lines, Steve Jobs figured out that, you know what, automation, we could have Siri do this. People can just walk into a store and talk to a computer, and then a computer could walk them through the steps, and they can do everything. The Apple Store sends you in the right direction. What if we use that and copied that and integrated that into more of our supermarkets? Technology is there and disruption is all around us, but it's not here yet. It's not here right now. People still want to talk to people. So at the end of the day, it's about using all this technology, using all this data to help people connect with people because that's what we want. That's what, that's what people want. That's how people want to feel connected, to talk, to have a feedback, to have a response. So I think that's a, even if you look at Starbucks on a smaller level, there's a huge volume of people coming in and out of those stores every day, and they're a national chain. How do they keep the, the small fit field? They ask you your name. They write your name on the cup when you get it. And they, they maintain that level of closeness. And I feel like we should look to use the data and technology to help make the overall supermarket shopping experience better. Thank you. Technology is making us a lot more efficient and a lot more productive in our, our everyday lives and our businesses. But with that, technology has also opened itself up to the newest terrorist threat um, we all have. Um, how have you guys handled or advised or worked with your clients in the area of cybersecurity? Zach, you wanna take a crack at that? Uh, sure, cybersecurity is something that by and large, I mean, we represent brands which ultimately represent to sell to consumers, right? So. When you heard that Target had that big security breach, the big reaction was, how the heck could you let this happen? And consumers expect companies to protect their data, to make the investments to do that, just like they need to take out insurance for their employees and other benefits. It's like assumed that it must be taken care of. So it's just an expectation that it's an investment that is expected to be made by all parties. And technology is an ever evolving area and it's new, it could be scary and also could be exciting. With the various topics that we spoke about today, um, we have touched on a number. What strategies or what tips can you give the audience? Zach? Yeah, this is a good one. You know, we're all so busy nowadays. And everyone's got to-do list to do, probably to-do list on top of their to-do list. Um, make time to be open-minded, number one, but to educate yourself 
and learn about what technology is evolving in. Literally every day, there's a new app that comes out that has the potential to make our lives better for the next you know, 25 years. Don't be that ignorant person that says, oh yeah, I know what Facebook is, but I don't need that. Or, I know what Instagram is, but I don't need that. Everybody, these are the new tools. This is what we're living in. And similar to how you know, certain people didn't have cell phones, didn't have email, didn't have laptops, have evolved and learned how to use that, guess what? It's going to be even worse for this generation now because everything is just starting to explode right now. It's a really exciting time to be alive, but allocate time to read, to understand, and maybe you could even come up with your own contribution because there's a lot of businesses that could be created just from taking what is already there and then putting that online. So I'd, I'd say be open-minded and share with your team. The last question before we open it up to the floor is, we've come a long way in the last number of years. What are you seeing or what are you going to be predicting that your clients, especially in the food and beverage space, are going to be doing over the next few years to stay ahead of the bell curve? Because if you don't stay ahead, you're going to fall behind. Zach, you want to start it off? Sure, yeah. And I'll, again, start with a question. And for the person who answered this correctly, you can see me after I have a special prize for you. All right. Nielsen came out with a report. They asked thousands of people, to make the store shopping experience better, what's the number one thing that you would want? And they asked thousands of consumers this. All right, now think about that. There's a lot of things, right? There's proximity to the store. There's parking your car. There's the aisle width in the stores. Does anyone have an idea of what the number one request from consumers was to enhance the store shopping experience? I'm hearing something, but I couldn't hear it clearly. Shorter lines. No, that's not it. Customer service, that's not it. Carts with no broken wheels. Carts with no broken wheels, that's not it. <laughs> yes. Um, how to get in and out faster? No, that's not it. Good news. Right. No. Better lighting. No. <laughs> all right, it's product sampling. Product sampling was the number one request from all consumers. Can you believe that? Can you believe that? People want to try products. They want to taste what's there before they make an investment, before they spend their hard-earned dollars and make a commitment to a brand that could be for years at a time. So retailers, I would say, and I'm asking the brands that we represent all the time, what is your budget for product sampling? Because if you lined the top 100 manufacturers in the country in a room and said, what's your view on product sampling? 50 of them would tell you, it stinks, we don't do it, it's a waste. And 50 of them would say, we love it. And what it comes down to is who does it? There are some demo agencies that it's all about existing just to do demos at a low cost, and it, you get what you pay for. If you pay the cheapest dollar out there, you're going to have someone who just does an agency and doesn't have the knowledge or passion or heart to actively sell those products. If you have someone that's an advocate of that product, that knows the attributes, that know where it's made, that knows the shelf life, that knows the sugar content and everything else attributed to it, it really makes a difference. And we see that, and we see stores get sold out sold out for effective product sampling. So I think every store should have sampling going on every day of the year. And Stu mentioned it, and I, I admire Stu for doing that in his stores, especially with the free ice cream giveaway if you spend $100. There are a lot of parents that love Stu Leonard's because of that. It's about enhancing the experience, and that's, that's where I see things going. Thank you. Open up to the questions on the floor. Hello, thank you uh, for the panel discussion today. I've worked with a lot of emerging brands, uh, micro entrepreneurs, and so specifically to uh, Zach and Jenna. Uh, Zach, question in terms of distribution and marketing, getting out there and driving sales, what's kind of the number one thing that you would recommend? What does that look like? Sure, so uh, yeah, this is a great question. Thank you. Omni does receive a lot of requests from specialty, which is on the rise, and startup products. And the biggest thing I'd say is, is be ready to scale. What I mean by that is we get sauces and juices and crackers and snacks and other proteins. Literally, people come to our office to hand deliver them. And then we start going through the checklist of questions that say, okay, do you have a budget allocated for spending? Do you have a budget allocated you know, for new item allowances to promote your product? And it's literally, we start losing people the more questions we ask. 
And then we realized these people are just not ready to go and sell to a 200 store supermarket chain where all these things are going to be expected. The retailer is going to expect this brand to have all the stuff ready when they walk in. Some, some founders of these brands kind of squeeze it like it's their baby and they don't want to let anyone touch it or guide it or give it direction. And I've seen some really great products die because they just weren't ready and open to, to what it takes to do business on a large level. Really enjoyed the panel. Whether we like it or not, all three of you, uh, there's sort of a, a technology push on what gets called digitalization. So it's massive influence by IT and infrastructure supporting it. It's happening. You know, get over it, get into it, get used to it, embrace it. I totally agree. But there's other data points that suggest that there's something different about food, so I'm going to make that assertion that <clears throat> maybe there's a place in food and beverages and more intimate experiences where we don't want a ton of digitalization in our lives. And that's, my, that's the lead up to the question. Is there a place where things like food, there's a human factor that we want? Yeah, consuming, consuming food is an experience. It's a bonding experience. You know, it's almost like one of the few sacred times that are left for families to sit around the dinner table and have that together. And there's something organic or wholesome about you putting in thought into and providing what is now on that table and being able to talk about it a little bit. Even going out to a certain kind of restaurant, there's a little thought behind it. So I think as long as, as that is sacred time, uh, in our society, then, then food is a little bit different. Um, just to add on that, some things are not included in that, right? So, you know, in Manhattan, the number one home delivery item, does anyone know what it is? Pizza? No. Anyone? Bottled water. Number one home delivery item. Why? Because the delivery man has to walk it up the stairs to where people live. So some items like that, paper towel, napkins, more commodity type items, Maybe that's maybe that could be affected by what's the technology going on. They've got to do a really good job of building their brands to separate themselves and stand out. Hi, uh, interesting discussion. Uh, I think uh, one one element in this whole food supply chain that the panel, I think, that I think we're going to address is uh, the logistics. So I don't know what the panel has in terms of your experience and opinion on. What do you see the earliest stage of the supply chain and how the technology is going to you know, help to uh, uh, advance or disrupt uh, this uh, whole business? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, so there was a shortage of drivers. There was uh, some regulation that came in that regulated the amount of uh, hours that drivers could drive nonstop. I'm sure everyone here has been stuck on traffic on 95 or another highway when a tractor trailer rolls over and a, a truck driver fell asleep from driving 16 hours straight and he was jacked up on Red Bull. You know, that happened, that's not going to happen anymore. So it's taken a little bit longer for deliveries to get where they're going, but the shortage of drivers has largely subsided, that's kind of gone. So there's a good amount of drivers to fill the trucking demand right now, but by and large, Manufacturers are all upgrading their infrastructure right now, and, and everyone's getting ready to do business at a much larger scale as our country grows, as our population grows. In terms of the technology, the biggest one is go down to Arizona and check out the self-driving cars and trucks. I mean, that's something that is probably going to come that we'll see, just like drones, and you may see trucks driving themselves in the future and deliveries being made by themselves in the future. So that's something to keep your eye on. Yes, absolutely. You know, um, nowadays food safety is number one. You know, you want to talk about like the viral society we live we live in. Talk about a recall. Let a recall and watch how fast that goes viral. And not only does it impact the item that was on recall, but it's. It's the entire brand, it's the entire category, and other brands too. So yes, blockchain does come into place where you, you know, in perishables, in proteins, we're talking about millions of animals that are harvested daily. 
across this country. I mean, just think about just the numbers of counting and tracking and being able to have all that. The technology is there, and, and herd sizes are tracked, and, and, and you could get it down to a, to a size. But yeah, it does need to get better, and it will get better. And we will get to a day where someone could you know, look at a package, scan it, and then within a matter of minutes, communication with that manufacturer, you can tell when and where that product was produced. Absolutely. First off, I want to say a great job by anybody here. Um, quick question. Um, what do you guys feel is the uh, biggest challenge for both retailers as well as manufacturers today in terms of filtering what they really need out of uh, technology? As far as Omni goes, we represent the different brands and every brand has its own starting point and where they're at along the journey of using you know, technology to help grow their business. Like I mentioned earlier, there are some guys that know to the hour of the day when their products are sold, there are some people that know exactly what age and male, female, you know, age demographic is buying their product. So every brand is different. It's about how and when they choose to invest in that information. Thank you, everybody. Yep. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Alan. And also, Rick Zach and Dan, I appreciate your insights. to renewable energy but we can handle all of like the packaging so it doesn't have to be like clean produce or like like fruits and vegetables without stickers on it we can take like full-on pallets of packaged Ben and Jerry's or like pasta or something like that um, and the machinery like the machine and equipment does it on its own so there's no manual separating of food okay. waste. that's really good to know so, yeah because that's kind of like what holds people back sometimes or sometimes we get a phone call Zach can you do anything with this load I've got 500 boxes this customer rejected it yeah like, yeah, should we dump it off the side of the road? You know? <laughs> You're like, maybe. It might be cheaper to do that. But yeah, we have a facility in Brooklyn, in Massachusetts, and New York. Uh, sorry, I already said New York. And Elizabeth, New Jersey. Um, and then our, we have one in LA that's our first site, so it's a little bit outdated technology. But the first, the three in the greater mid Atlantic are all capable for like depackaging and stuff like that. So we know it's like a problem that hopefully it can address those issues. <laughs> it does, it helps. I mean, it doesn't help anyone when good food gets thrown away. Yeah, yeah. You know? So just wanted to introduce myself. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank I'll definitely you. be in touch. Good job up there. It was definitely <laughs> good to hear. Thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> water bottles in New York City. Yeah. I believe it. Yeah. Yeah, who wants to carry them up five no flights one. of stairs? <laughs> Hi there. It's nice to hear you. I'm John Matthew. I'm with uh, PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers. Thank you. Nice to meet you too, John. We do a lot in the food and beverage side. Mm -hmm. And um, um, from a internet of things versus like the whole gambit. I mean, we're, 50 billion bucks as a company and food and beverage is an interesting space. You guys based, where are you get The Bronx. Bronx. Yeah. Okay. What part of the Bronx? Hunts Point. Hunts Point. Okay. So here's what I, do you have a card on you? Yeah. Why don't we set up some time to chat? Okay. You know, maybe after this, we could talk about clients we have in common and maybe, you know, things we can collaborate on. Sure. All right. Absolutely. All right. Thank you. That's, thank you. You were sitting on the right, right? Yes. Yeah, you, yeah. You, you clearly had the, I mean, you're really into this stuff. I mean, what does is, what is your company do? Thank you. Omni Food Sales is a brand advocate. We work oh, for yeah, the right, brands. Right, right, right. We're their representative. You made the distinction of advocate versus a broker. Yes. Right, yeah, yes. right, okay. Yes. Uh, but you, you clearly understand technology. I try. I'm yeah. learning you every also, day. You also seem to clearly understand the dynamics or the physiology or the psychology of, of food retail mm -hmm. and wholesale. I've been in it, right. by and large, my whole life. Yep, yep. Like yep. That, but I mean, she'd be really good because she is like that type of person. That's what we're looking for. We're looking for that. Okay, definitely. All right, nice to meet you. Good to see you again. All right.